start our time together tonight by sharing with you just a, a little story. How about that? Sound like a good way to start? I'm going to share with you a little story about something that happened to me when I started working, after I got out of school. Okay, so I had graduated just two weeks back and I had taken a job with McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Corporation because I had some immense student loans that needed to be paid back as quickly as possible. Now, about halfway through my first week of working, Okay, and you know, you know how first weeks of working goes. So it's a matter of you know, getting a badge, finding where your desk is, meeting who you're working with, all this sort of stuff's going on. An engineer came up to me, and I'm going to call him Rick because his name was Rick. Okay, and Rick worked in a very very special group at McDonnell Douglas. He worked in the weights and measurements group. Now that's an engineering group that determines how much everything that went onto the airplane weighed. Now the F-18 is an aircraft that lands on carriers out at sea and also gets thrown off the carrier using a very fancy catapult system. So it really, really mattered how much the aircraft weighed. Now his department worried about everything that was on the plane, including uh, the weight of every bullet, every drop of water, no, I'm sorry, every drop of oil, and of course every sticker that was put on the aircraft. Now Rick had hunted me down because he knew that I was a member of the F-18's mission computer group. Okay. And he had one simple question for me. His question was, how much did the airplane's computer software weigh? <laughs> See, Rick was a little bit dangerous, okay? Because he had got, he knew that the airplane's computers came from the factory. And when they came from the factory, they had no software on them. He knew that my department took our control programs, loaded them into the computers, <laughs> and then we took the computers and we loaded them into the aircraft. So clearly, the computer that got loaded into the aircraft must weigh more than the one that came from the factory, and he needs to know how much it costs. Uh, and you can imagine how flustered I was. Just like two weeks on the job and already being confronted by an idiot. Okay? So I did what any engineer would do. I went to my boss. Okay? And uh, he was an older and wiser engineer, and I was hoping that he had some magical way to make Rick go away. Okay? And I still can remember seeing my boss sit back in his chair stroke his chin as I explained to him my, my tale of woe. And he finally sat up straight and said, listen, I have a solution. Now, in order to explain the solution, we have to go back in time, kids. Okay? And when we go back in time, there's a small detail I need to mention to you. At this point in time, computer programs were stored on something that we called punch cards, which you've probably only seen in books and history museums at this point in time. But the way this would work is you would type one line of your computer code, and it would go on to one particular punch card. Okay? Put a whole bunch of punch cards together in a deck, and effectively, that was your computer program back in the day. This is long before floppy disks or anything like that. Okay? Now, what my boss did at this particular point in time was an act of sheer genius. He walked over to one of the punch machines that prints out these cards, and he printed out the entire deck that represented the F-18 uh, aircraft's control program. He then took the cards and threw them away. And then behind the machine, there was a little bin where all the little punch outs got pushed so they could be thrown away. And he took that collection of basically computer card fluff and gave it to me. He said, go weigh it. <laughs> so I went down the hall to the mail room, they, they had mail rooms back in the day, and I weighed it, and it weighed, I don't know, roughly like two ounces. And I came back to him, he said, great, go tell him that's what the computer software weighs. <laughs> so I called up Rick, I told him what the story was, and you know, I have, uh, I've never seen Rick ever again after that, and to the best of my knowledge, somewhere in the world there's an F-A-18 uh, technical spec book that tells you that a loaded mission computer weighs two ounces more than an unloaded one. All right. So now on to our reason for being together tonight. So congratulations. You've had a very good weekend. You've had a successful microcontroller conference. You guys spent your time very wisely. But let's talk about the bigger picture. This is a successful weekend. But where do you go from here, guys? You know, this is, this is good. But what have you done with your life so far? Okay, if I understand things correctly, um, you're hoping to be a success. Does that, does that seem like a reasonable thing? I mean, if we have non-success and success, you'd really prefer to take the success route, right? Uh, that's cool. Do you know how to do that? You have a class on how to be successful? 
class on how not to be successful? <laughs> I mean, that'd be pretty easy. You know, just don't whatever that one to you. All right. All right, so great. So you want to be successful, but no clue. All right, so maybe this gives us something to talk about. So what's in store for you? I mean, at least let's at least try and predict the future. No magic eight ball needed for this. All right, so what do we know? We know in what, two, three, four, five, and for some of you, zero years, you'll be out of school, right? You'll graduate. What happens then? Well, you go out and get a job, right? And you work at the job, and then you retire, and then life's over, right? So in a nutshell, that's your life, correct? Have a there's always somebody who puts up their hands and so I'm going to win the lottery, right? And that's cool. But you know, I buy lottery tickets too, so I'm winning before you. So just don't even think about that. So that's all good. All right. So what do you want? You want more out of life? You want to actually change the world or something silly like that? I mean, really? All right. Who do you think you are? What are you, everyone's going to change the world? I don't think so. Why, what makes you so special that you can change the world? Well, your mom said you could. Okay, well, that's cool. All right, so I'll tell you, good news for you. You Look, I'm in the same situation as you. As long as I'm going to spend all this time on the planet, I may as well change it, right? Hopefully for the better, but whatever. We'll go with, you know, how are you going to change it, right? Okay. Now, I've spent the last 25 years of my professional career working to achieve it, and the good news is, is I think I know how to change the world. Well, hopefully that gets your attention, right? All right, so that gives us something to talk about. Now, I'd like to start our brief time together tonight by explaining the slide that you see up here. Okay, um, there's a very large picture of me on there, right? Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, uh, and also has my name in large letters. Okay, now, so one of two things is very clear here: either I have a very serious ego issue, or I'm trying to make a point right off the bat. Well, first off, I do have a very large ego, but that's fine. Okay, but let's pretend for a moment that I'm actually trying to make a point. So your time at USF so far has been hopefully a wonderful experience for you, okay? So you were special. You got accepted by the university, right? And you then got accepted by the engineering program. So congratulations. That shows that you actually bring something to the table. That's great news. Now, so how does life goes, go now? You go to class, you raise your hand, you turn in your homework, you take tests, they get graded, they get returned to you. That is fantastic. You are somebody very special. However, you know you're going to screw this up, right? You're going to graduate. When you graduate, the party's over, right? No more homeworks, no more tests, no more gold stars. <laughs> Sorry about that. It all wraps up at this point in time. What this means is that if you really want to become a success and make a difference in the world, you're going to have to learn the gentle art of self-promotion. So nobody's going to show up and say that you're great and that you're doing a fabulous job. You need to go show people that you're great and that you're doing a good job. So once again, note my oversized picture of myself. This is an example of self-promotion. Okay? Us engineers suffer from a syndrome that I call build it and they will come. Okay? What happens is that we think that by doing great work, we hope that others are going to notice us and that we'll get rewarded for it. Right? I do good work. You notice. I get rewarded. Life is good. Right? doesn't work that way, guys. Um, let me be the first to tell you that life doesn't work that way and that you're going to be responsible for your own success as you move through life. Now, how to make that happen is something that we can talk about tonight. Okay. I'd like to thank uh, the crew for uh, the great introduction. Now, but even after those fine words, you might be saying, so who's Dr. Anderson? Okay. And why am I your keynote speaker tonight? I like to think about my role here tonight is being similar to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the classic movie, Terminator. Now, anybody, everybody in here seen Terminator? I mean, you're engineers, so you're sort of required to, right? I don't know, whatever. Right. Just in case anybody, uh, either I'm dating myself, because it did come out a long time ago, or if somebody doesn't remember what happens in the movie. So Arnold plays the role of a robot, gets sent back in time to help out a young man who's going to become special in the future. Uh, since I'm an engineer who's roughly halfway through my career, view me as being sent back through time to have a talk with you, uh, in part because you're going to become special in the future also. Okay? Now, this might be the wrong time to be asking this question. However, I think the answer might be critical to understanding your long-term success, so I'm going to go ahead and ask anyway. Um, real quick question, why did you go to college? Build robots. Uh, Starbucks. Build robots. <laughs> Starbucks wasn't hiring. <laughs> Starbucks is always hiring. By the way, that's, that's really not a problem. You know, if you're like most of us, the reason you went to college was because...
because it was what everybody else was doing, right? You wrap up high school, everyone applies to college, you figure you apply to college. Mom and dad expected you to do it. Mom and dad didn't give you a lot of other options. <laughs> All right, you know, we're just sort of going with the flow to speak, okay? You know, that seems like the natural thing to do. It, you know, motherhood, apple pie, going to college seems like a good thing, right? But think about it. If you've been working for Starbucks for the last four, five, six years, however long it is, just think, you could be making seven bucks an hour, man. And more importantly than that, you would not have been paying for college classes. So minimizing your expenses, maximizing your income, you could be sitting on a pile of cash right now as opposed to what you're doing, which is not sitting on a pile of cash, right? All right. Now, from an economic point of view, you sure seem to have made an odd choice. By the way, Starbucks makes great coffee, and I'll bet you if you work there, you get it for free. I'm just saying, okay, I'm just saying. All right, now, I went to college for 15 years, okay, and I will confess that I didn't know the answer to this question until I got out of school. Right, because I hadn't really thought about it. Right, uh, it was only then I was able to look back and understand that just how much going to college and getting a degree had had an impact both on my life and also on my bank account. Okay, now I'm willing to I'm willing to bet that you are a very different person today than you were when you first started at USF. Even if you just started at USF this year, no matter what, at this point in time, you're a very different person. Okay, there. I'd say that there's at least three changes that have occurred. And what these three changes mean is that you could never go back. You could never become the person that you were before you started going to USF. Okay? And what are these three magical changes, you ask? Well, good news. I'm going to tell you. All right. So the, what's, the first one is, look, by going to college, you've started a four-year program. Okay? And right now, it looks like you're going to finish it. You know, that's huge. The number of people in the world who can start something, work at it for four years, and achieve it at the end of that point in time is very small. That's an incredible accomplishment. Okay? The fact that you're going to be able to do it is going to speak volumes to anybody out there who might be looking to hire somebody. It says, I can start things, I can work at things, and I can finish things. And this is very, very impressive. Okay? Next, I hope that you realize that you're not attending college to learn things from a book. Okay, if you were doing that, you should really have gone to you know, a trade school, which is what that's all about. Instead, by going to college, you're going to learn to do something that's far more important. You know, the world is made up of tough problems, problems that don't have an answer at the back of the book. right? And in college, what you learn to do is take those big, tough problems, break them up into smaller problems, solve the smaller problems, and then put it all back together. And that's an incredible skill. It gives you the ability to solve real-world nasty, hairy problems. And that's exactly the type of skill that's going to see you through your entire career. Okay, third thing. Let me ask you a question here. When you graduated from high school, how many people did you know? How many people had you met that you knew by first name? 37. 37. Maybe 100 if we get crazy, if we include family and relatives and all that sort of stuff like that. Maybe 150. You know, there's always a couple of military brats in the, in the room that always say, well, you know, I've met people all over the place. But the majority of us, we're probably at like 150 to 200 if we stretch, right? Cool, now you're going to university. How many students go to USF? 50 some thousand? Yeah, it's like 46, somewhere between 46 and 50. All right, and every time you take a class, are there new people in those classes? I mean, there's some faces you haven't seen before, probably, right? Especially taking some of those general studies classes. Who the heck are those people, right? So no matter what, you've met people from a bunch of places that you probably never knew existed before you went to classes here. And what makes those people different? Well, first off, they wear funny clothes, they eat funny food, they talk in funny languages, right? And they see the world completely differently than you do. And guess what? When you get out into the world, those are the people that you're going to be working with. We're not all like you, right? You need to understand that there's a wide variety of people out there that you need to be able to work with them and get along with them. That is a huge understanding. By attending USF, you've probably met more people than people who don't go to college will ever meet in their entire life. So, you think you know how to solve real life problems, huh? Now, as this picture shows, sometimes it's not just a matter of putting the donkey before the cart, 
but more importantly, not making sure that you haven't overloaded the cart. Now, this brings up a very good point. Okay. Have you taken the time to plan out your career? Careers is one of those big words that we hear people talking about. We don't really think about it all that much. But let's start it out this way. Um, how long do you plan on having your career last? How long do people work? How many years? It's a math problem. So let's play a game here. Let's say that you start working when you're about 20-ish. When, when do people retire? See, you hope so. <laughs> All right, so let's say 65, 70, something like that. So how many years are you going to work? 80. Uh, yeah, 40, 45 is traditional. If you manage your money poorly, 50, 55, <laughs> definitely. So really what we're talking about is, is a career that's coming up, right? And it's going to be about 40 or 45 years long. Oh, my. Okay, so if you take a high-level look at your life, so it takes you about... 20 years to get to and get through college, right? Then you work for maybe 40, 45 years. And how long do you think you spend in retirement? Two years, you dropped out after a hundred. No, 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 no. <laughs> sorry, it's not nearly that good. Let's say about 20 years, okay? So it's like 20, 45, 20, effectively is a life, okay? Well, man, if the biggest part of it is 40 to 45 years, it sure seems like you'd like to have a plan for that, right? Do you have a plan? No, okay, all right, you're just going to wing it, right? See how it goes, all right. The majority of people don't have a plan for it. All right, well, we'll see what we can do about that tonight. Okay. Um, one important point that all of us engineers to realize, need to realize is that the knowledge that you're going to acquire when you go to university has a shelf life. Okay, it doesn't last forever. Now, back in the 1960s, a long time ago, the shelf life of an engineering career was about 14 years. Okay, so what you learned in university was going to carry you for about 14 years. Guess how long your shelf life is now? Six months? It's actually three years. Now, remember, the basics are the basics. They don't change, okay? But it's the cool stuff, the cool stuff that you'll cover during your junior and senior years, right? The sort of cutting edge, the sort of novel sort of stuff, almost sort of like the stuff you did over the course of this weekend. Cool now, but in three years it's going to be old hat. Right? It will have moved on to something newer, cooler, faster, better, right? Darn it. <laughs> You're working awfully hard to learn some stuff that's going to change. Okay, there may no longer be tests. However, there will be a great deal of study involved if you want to keep your engineering skills sharp. Okay, we're engineers, and it's all too easy to believe that we can solve any problem. However, sometimes our solutions are not the best solutions. Okay. Now, in my case, I went to work in the field of telecommunications, and that particular area of engineering has been undergoing massive changes throughout my entire career. Okay, now, there's no way that I could have kept my skills sharp if I had only relied on what I had learned in school. Okay? It was a good start, but so much has changed since then. All of my old textbooks are effectively, at this point in time, useless. Okay? The way that I saw my engineering need to have information on new technologies spoon-fed to me was in my particular case was by joining the Institute for Electro, Electro, Electrical and Electronics Engineers, also known as the IEEE. Okay? Now this costs me probably about $200 a year, okay? but it is well worth it. Okay? For the past 20 years, I've been ahead of pretty much every single trend in networking, and I've had detailed information about new technologies long before they showed up in my workplace. My colleagues and my bosses have always been amazed that I always knew about things that were just showing up in the workplace. Now, I'm an IEEE booster, but I choose not to share my secret with my coworkers. <laughs> now, I don't know what there is about us engineers, but we always seem to stand out in the crowd. And I'm quite confident that you've learned enough to be successful during your time here at USF. However, there's still a great deal for you to learn, okay? Sometimes the most overwhelming thing can be trying to figure out what you still don't know. One of the most important things that I can share with you from the real world of engineering careers is that as an engineer, you will have a certain value to a company that hires you. Okay? What that means is that if I give you a job, you'll be able to produce a design, you'll be able to do some work, you'll be able to solve a problem. And that has a value to me as an employer. However, one of the great secrets to life is that if you move up, and if you become a manager, your value increases. 
okay, and you become more valuable to the company. The reason for this is because as an effective manager, you have the ability to draw out of other engineers their best work. You can organize a group of engineers and you can get them to focus on solving a problem and you can get them to contribute their best work to solve a problem. And if you have that ability all of a sudden to a company, you are even more valuable than a, a frontline engineer. Now being a manager is, as Martha Stewart would say, a very good thing. However, being a leader is even more valuable. And there's a difference here. If you're a manager, you can make things happen. You can tell people to do things and they will do it because they have to, because they work for you. And if they don't do it, you'll fire them. All right? That's pretty simple. That's the way the world works. However, if you're a leader, you can make it so people want to do things. They want to help you achieve whatever you're trying to achieve. Okay, so this brings up the awkward question of whether or not you have the skills that it's going to take to be an engineering leader. <laughs> more, maybe more importantly, just what skills are you going to need to have to be an engineering leader, right? Now, we're all different, but I can tell you at a minimum, you're going to have to have the ability to speak in public. Okay, that's an important skill to have. You're going to have to understand how to manage people. Okay? You're going to have to have the knowledge about how business works. And oh, by the way, having some negotiation skills would be nice too. Okay? So clearly you've got more learning to do. You've got this learning that you're going to have to be doing going forward to stay, keep your engineering skills sharp. Okay? Almost a full-time gig right there. But then on top of that, there's additional skills that it's going to take you to make it so that you can manage people. So you can develop this whole new set of skills. So clearly you've got more learning to do. Now, I thought long and hard about how best to tell you about what I think that you need to know in order to have a successful life, when all of a sudden it struck me, it's already out there. Okay? Now, I'm the proud father of three small children, and what this means is that Milton Bradley's The Game of Life is always out at my house. And it turns out that this game can teach us the ten things that all of us need to know to get through life. Are you ready? Ten things. Feel free to take out a pencil and paper at any point in time. All right, so number one, life is a journey. It's a long journey. Number two, an education is a key to a good job. Number three, nobody wants to be a journalist. They're, already, they're always broken and angry. Okay? <laughs> Number four, decisions made early in the game will either help you or haunt you later. Anybody got tattoos? Anybody? Okay, just checking. Um, number five, the person you start with in your car is ideally the person you want to end up with. Number six, why is it that kids never seem to, get to, seem to be willing to get out of the car and start their own game of life? Number seven, always buy stock. Number eight, when you bet on something, you have a 90% chance of not winning. However, this seldom prohibits anybody from betting. Number nine, when people are losing the game, that's generally when they do most of their betting. And number 10, pay your debts. A day of reckoning is coming. Now, I'm getting close to the end of my presentation here tonight, but I would like to let you know that with success comes responsibility. Okay? Your professors have taken the time to share with you the knowledge that they learned, uh, that they were once taught. Now, you're becoming our next generation of engineers, okay? And we have great expectations for what fantastic inventions you're going to be able to come up with and the successes that you will become. However, we also expect that you will pass on the knowledge that you have, okay? And you don't have to be a university professor to do this. Every time you help a child with their math homework, every time you judge a science fair, or every time you go to a school for a career day, you will be doing your part to grow the next generation of engineers. Okay? I want to wrap things up by sharing with you one final embarrassing personal story. Okay? And it's my hope that this story will serve as a reminder to all of you that on the basis of this competition you participated in, it might be getting a little bit too big for your britches. It might be thinking a little bit too much of yourself. Just take you down a notch, perhaps. <laughs> So this picture of a driveway is very similar to a driveway that I had on my house when I lived in South Florida. Now, I liked my driveway, but there was one small problem with my driveway. I had weeds that were growing up in between the little paver bricks there. Now, there were a number of different ways I could have solved that problem. Simplest one would be to go out and actually pull the weeds out, right? Another way to do it would be to spray it with some sort of deadly poison, which would have killed the weeds, right? But I'm an engineer. And so I wanted to solve this problem once and for all. So my plan was to purchase some sand and fill the gaps in, in between the bricks. No gaps, 
no weeds. Makes sense to me, right? So I got out the Yellow Pages and looked up companies that sold fill sand, and it turns out there was a lot of companies that did that. Now, I called up the first company, and the question they asked me was, how much sand did I want to buy? Well, I hemmed and I hawed, and I said, well, you know, the driveway's about yay by yay. It's like a three-car garage. And so like they said, listen, we sell sand by yards. Well, I said, you know, I've got a driveway. It's a three-car garage, a three-car driveway, so there's a fair number of yards there. I, they said, listen, <laughs> it turns out that a truck of sand in South Florida is pretty cheap to buy. Okay? And the truck had, as they told me, about three yards in it. I said, well, you know, I probably need more than that, but I'll start with the truck. <laughs> so I was home when the truck showed up and dumped the sand. Um, now, it turns out when the sand company was talking about sand, they were talking in three dimensions. Now, when I was talking about sand, I was talking in two dimensions. Okay? And, of course, um, I got a lot more sand than I had anticipated. And, of course, the sand was dumped at my request on the driveway, blocking both of my cars in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to add insult to injury, it turns out that it really only took probably about two buckets of sand to fill in all the cracks in the, uh, in the driveway. So, yeah, we overestimated uh, significantly there. For the next week, I spent hours every day shoveling sand and then trying to hide it in other parts of my yard. Okay? The lesson from this story, oh, you overconfident engineers, you, is to always double check your units. Okay? So congratulations, guys. I hope you had a great weekend. I know you're going to be a great success. Good luck with everything that you do in the future.